Tape is rolling. <clears throat> okay. First question would be, uh, as Air Force, as an Air Force colonel, and we, we talked about this a little bit, but I'll reiterate it for the tape. Mm -hmm. uh, were you a civilian or in the armed forces when you developed your interest in UFOs? I was actually in the armed forces. I was supervising a team of technical experts that were installing special equipment aboard the B-29s flying their target profile missions on Russia because there was a school of thought at the time that they must be coming in through the polar uh, donut someplace up there that uh, the, the, the Van Allen belt may have had something to do with it and that they were coming through uh, the polar airspace and then going elsewhere. <clears throat> and so the Air Force had a, a, a survey team up in Alaska that was installing special equipment aboard the B-29s to look for them coming in. And what year was that? That was 1946 and 47. Ah, okay. It was that 1947 year again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. What exactly are the laws and policies regarding enlisted people divulging information that they may have witnessed about UFOs and have you received any guff or retaliation from superiors about your research and investigations? Well, <clears throat> the whole phenomena, the whole UFO phenomena is considered a national security problem by people that manage the uh, research effort for the government. And it's uh, heavily compartmentized like uh, all intelligence operations and uh, only the people that have a need to know get any information in or ask any questions. The rest don't get anything. Um, the punishments for violation of national, it's considered a national security matter. The punishments for violating a national security oath are pretty severe. They could be $10,000 fine, 10 years in prison, and, and or paying a forfeiture of all paying allowances due or ever to become due. I don't know of any case where this has been adjudged because <clears throat> it appears to me that, that uh, by pursuing somebody in this fashion, they may, may tend to uh, support or tend to confirm what he has said. So they, they resort to other uh, cheaper and easier methods, and that is uh, to uh, discredit in any way they can, uh, showing that they have mental problems or aberrations of various kinds, uh, bring odious charges against you if, they, if that's what's needed to discredit to me. Turn people away so that they don't want to listen to what you might have said. Uh, the other alternatives are to eliminate you one way or another, get rid of you. So uh, the, the simplest method is just keep quiet and don't get involved at all. Okay. And people that are involved in this understand that. Have you had any experience with any sort of... Well, I don't want to discuss that because it might lead too far. I. I uh, yes, I've been t picked up a couple of times and taken into interrogation, and what they always ask me is, why do I think that I need to pursue such a ridiculous subject? What does it gain me? Why? What? What's in it for me? Why do I have to persist in asking questions of people under oath, uh, reporting information that's controversial? Uh, all I'm doing is muddying the water for somebody else, they say, and uh, and and they always ask me to agree to stop. Well, I usually agree to stop because that's the only way you're going to get out of there. And then something interesting comes up and I'm back in it again. That's a good answer. <laughs> okay, we've already said that you're, you're not really familiar with the Larry Warren no. case. Okay. Okay. You seem very interested in contact cases versus the technical hardcore, the ship landed here and the radiation did this information. Why are you so interested in contactees? Well, I'm interested in the other as well because that has evidence that's testable. And the contact cases are of interest to me because often dialogue has taken place and questions have been that the contactee has asked have been answered. So we get more information out of a contact case than an evidence case. Okay. Okay. I'd like to throw in one more question on that issue. Um, do you have any model or any uh, formula to assert that what the communication has been is valid information? <clears throat> no, I, do I have a model to validify information that we get? No, I, 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 it's, it's so many different ways. First of all, 
you need to know something about the man's character and personality, which means you have to talk to his friends and relatives. You have to know what his habits are. Is he, is he uh, inclined to tell stories or to embellish information? And that means talking to close friends or, or know his habits and how he acts, reacts. Uh, I, no, I don't, I, that's, that's about what I think, uh, and I forgot the, the, the question is what <laughs> I'm trying to answer here. Okay, um, when you hear of a contactee and oh, okay. they have information and they say, this is what they said, how do we know whether what is reported is accurate? Is yeah. accurate. Okay, well, yeah. It, <clears throat> so the contactee information is is of interest because you, you get more of it. Then how do you verify it? Uh, you, you, you have to study the man and, and find out if there are problems in his, the stories that he tells. And whether you can do anything with contact information, probably not unless you get it cross-supported by something else. It tends to give it validity. Okay, okay, good. Good, good, good. Okay, with all the work you've done, as has Jim Delatosa on the Billy Meyer case, um, why do you think you have such strong detractors even today? Why do you think uh, an organization such as MUFON would declare the whole thing a fraud? Well, <clears throat> it's probably because when we got into this, we early on we it looked like it was going to take a lot of it. It's not going to be a one-night investigation, or a week, or maybe not even a month, which means we have to have staying power. We have to have money, you have to have resource, you have to have equipment, you have to do a lot of things. None of the clubs had money to send anybody anywhere. They didn't have equipment to furnish you. They couldn't afford to rent equipment. The clubs are obviously unable to do this. That's in MUFON, MAPRO, Kupos, all of them have the same problem. They have a little bit of money, but not enough to do anything. So. We had an interest in learning more about the case, uh, me because of the photographs, and, and I persuaded some friends of mine, uh, Lee and Tom Welch and Britt, uh, to join me in the investigation because they had their own money to, to do what they needed to do. And they agreed to do this, provided we could find some way of getting a return on the money. And it, that didn't happen until we were well along, and it was several years later when the Japanese came along and wanted to do a video documentary on it. And we gave them uh, a figure on how much money we had invested up to this point in the investigation. They agreed to refund that in return for an opportunity to produce a video documentary for in Nippon Television in Japan. So they did. They, they repaid all of our expenses against the, our expense, list, expense listings including expenses in Switzerland and a payment from Meyer, and, and we gave them the material. So now we have what we were after. We have the collection of data and information. We have the testing. The testing was all done uh, in big laboratories that had their own research budgets, and they were interested in what we had because it signified directions of research, new directions of research that they could look at. And so we would go into some place like Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, and they would look at what we had, and they'd decide what they wanted to find out about it for themselves. They'd tell us what they could do. And it was always more than we could do, so we'd agree to their insistence that we sign a non-disclosure agreement, that we could not describe who they were or what they did without their written permission for a, a time limit. It was going to expire something in something like 10 years. <coughs> and we had... We ran into this every place we went. So after the second place, we decided to create our own non-disclosure agreement. We'd go in armed with our own non-disclosure agreement. When they produced theirs, we'd produce ours. We'd cross sign them mutually, and that meant that they're not going to be hung out, and nor are we. Well, this didn't include the clubs. It didn't include anybody. That And so when the clubs started trying to follow our tracks, they ran into the non-disclosure agreements. They were told that they didn't have, didn't have any evidence that we had been, had been there. And at NASA, uh, uh, in Pasadena, California, the big NASA facility there, at, when we went in the first day, we told Frank Bristol, who was then the, the administrative supervisor of the facility, what we wanted to do, and he invited us to come out and talk to him. Well, we went in and signed their guest book and everything, and were shown into his office when he saw what we had and what we wanted to do. He said, look, go out there and sign out again. Then come around the back door and come in and I'll give you a 
office passes. 